model your domain and derive the rest. So we're going to get into what that means. Um, I think you'll see, you'll see that through uh, example here in a bit. So uh, what we're going to talk about today um, is we're going to talk about declarative design. And then we're going to talk a little bit about Spark, which is one of our core, core tools that allow for declarative design. We're going to go through some of the basics of what a resource is. Um, and then we're going to talk about advanced features of Ash and resources. Uh, and then we'll talk about extending Ash. And we'll kind of put a nail in it with deriving the rest. And we'll talk a little bit about the roadmap. Um, so feel free to stop me. I, I've been told that I, I can have a habit of rushing through things. So I'm going to stop at the end of each of these sections for questions instead of once at the end, just so that people can, can get the clarification that they need, um, without having to wait till the end of the talk. So, uh, let's talk about declarative design. Um, I'm by no means a, like a, the pioneer of declarative design. People have been doing this for, you know, 50 years. Um, but the uh, general idea is to separate your declaration from your implementation. And a, a great example of a declarative language might be uh, HTML or SQL. In all of these cases, you state what you like, what the end result should be, but you, you don't describe how to render pixels in, in the browser, for example. And with SQL, for example, you tell it what data you want. Um, and, you know, maybe give it some instructions that, you know, like join might feel like an instruction, but you don't tell it how to iterate over the tables and connect values together and all, all that sort of things, right? So it's declarative. You, you, you have your declaration and the implementation is separate from that. <clears throat> and in some cases hidden from you. So let's talk about some of the benefits of declarative design. Um, the first thing here is that it's easy to understand the intent. When you're looking at something that is built with the principles of declarative design, it's usually easy to understand, you know, even if you don't know how it does the thing that the person has asked it to do, you at least can see what they asked it to do, ask, asked it to do. Um, for example here, this is from our, um, uh, you're going to see a lot of uh, snippets here from resources and code snippets and most of it, I think it, actually all of it is from Ash HQ. Uh, so that's our documentation website that is built with live view and it, it actually, you know, it's not a static site. So it actually does quite a bit. It imports packages from hex and, you know, copies our documentation into a database so we can do full text search, all that sort of stuff. And so there's quite a bit of good examples, uh, in that app. Um, so here, this is on the guides resource, this little snippet that you're looking at here. Um, and this is a section, uh, one of the things that we do when we import hex documentation is we transform the HTML, the markdown into HTML. And so you can see here, if you were looking at a resource that had this, you could probably intuit that, well, one of the things it does is it takes the text attribute and it renders that as HTML into the text HTML attribute. And you can also see, well, it generates a table of contents. And that is useful to know, even though you didn't read the code, you don't know how it does it or, or, or necessarily why, but you know what it's doing. <clears throat> Another thing that is important here is you can you surface your model, but most importantly, your assumptions. How you think the world works is sort of first classed with declarative design. And to show you what I mean, this is the first iteration of the render markdown DSL that we had written for Ash HQ. We had a render attribute, which says render the text attribute, and we said render that into text HTML. <clears throat> and what we realized is, well, huh, hold on. Some of these things need to render multiple attributes to HTML. And so obviously like a single render attribute option is not enough. And that's surfaced right here at the front. So when we realize what we had done wrong, we can, we know what to talk about. And you can see we have clarity on what is changing. So we were able to look at the DSL that we had made and we say, okay, well, what needs to happen is we need a way to specify that we're going to, a way to specify multiple attributes that might be rendered in HTML and where they might be rendered. And we can have that conversation separately without ever having to discuss like the nitty gritty of exactly how it's going to work. So now we have the ability to, uh, to discuss, are we talking about our model of this problem changing or are we talking about, uh, the implementation of that model changing? Uh, one thing that they do is they help us communicate and understand. So, uh, one of the things that, that when you've, when you've been building applications for a long time, as I'm sure many of us has, we know that names. Uh, they sort of creep into our code. And these are the names that people use out in the real world too, right? Like it's not just the code isn't like a pure thing. We start talking about the terms. And so like in this case, render markdown is a thing that our app does. And some non-technical stakeholder might know about that. They know we will render markdown, right? And so by 
isolating all of this into its into a little configuration language. This is a tiny little language here, right? Um, but by isolating it here, we can have those conversations and communicate clearly. And uh, I mentioned non-technical stakeholders. Uh, this is something like anybody can read this. You don't have to be that technical to read this and understand what's happening. And that is really useful in some settings. Sometimes you don't care if you're just building a tool for yourself then, or, or if you're, you know, it's just you and the engineers, maybe it doesn't matter. Um, but in my experience, this actually enables a level of collaboration between non-technical stakeholders and your technical teams where you're both working, you have a, a, this little bridge, a sort of corpus of your application that you can all talk about. And that can be extremely useful. Uh, so before I move on to the next section, are there any questions about declarative design? Uh, next, we're gonna talk about Spark. Uh, Spark is a GitHub, or it's a, a package, it's a literature package that we extracted out from Ash, and it is a tool for building DSLs. Um, now, because it was extracted from Ash, the documentation could probably use a lot of love. However, um, it's getting much better uh, over time. So Spark actually powers all of the DSLs that you're going to see in Ash. Spark is the underlying tooling that makes that possible. And you can even see a resource, um, if you look at the code sample, is it says use spark.dsl. So a resource is defined um, by using Spark as a tool. Uh, and Spark is also where the extensibility of Ash actually comes from. So I'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, but Spark actually sets the core design patterns of Ash. The declarative design patterns are primarily actually laid down by uh, using Spark to build a DSL and then to uh, configure an intros uh, to, to have introspectable configurations um, that are uh, more than just like a YAML file, for example, because they're in code, you can do all sorts of things. Um, and so here's a sort of good example of, I can ask an API in Ash what resources it has. I can ask a resource what attributes it has. I can ask it what, what its policies are or what PubSub notifications it broadcasts. And in all of these cases, I'm using uh, a standard pattern where we have the configuration statically elsewhere, and then we have configuration-driven tools that use that. Uh, Spark also makes DSLs um, less magic in general. So one of the things that you find when you're building DSLs with Elixir, they can be very useful, but to build an Elixir DSL, you need to write a lot of macros. And it's easy at first, like when you write the first couple macros, it's at the first couple options, but then you start needing to do things that require a lot of really complicated metaprogramming at compile time. And these things are, they're honestly very difficult. And Spark represents multiple years of knowledge of how to actually do these things, but distilled in a tool that anybody can use. So this is a good example. This right here is actually how we declare an attribute in Ash. We define a thing called a Spark entity. And that Spark entity has, go back there, has um, uh, a target, like what struct it builds, and it has a schema, all that sort of stuff. And Spark builds us the DSL for us. I don't have to write any macros. I mean, I wrote Spark, so I had to write quite a few macros, but you know, you guys won't have to write any macros if you use it. Um, and here's an example of a schema, a section of the schema for the attribute resource. You can see it's all typed. So Spark will type check all of your, all of your stuff. Um, it provides default values. Um, there's a lot more that it can do. Um, one of the things I, I haven't touched on here um, that I probably should have, but uh, Spark, um, <clears throat> It also does the, uh, it has an Elixir Sense extension or Elixir Sense plugin that provides autocomplete and inline documentation for any DSL built with Spark. And you don't have to, you don't have to do anything except have Elixir LS running and it will automatically get picked up and show you autocomplete in your resource. And that's really useful. Um, now granted Elixir LS doesn't like always work. So, but when Elixir LS is working, um, then it is uh, extremely useful. <clears throat> and we also derive our documentation from these static definitions. So it's got that never wrong quality because it's derived from these structures. So Spark supports extensions. Um, and this is an example of a little micro extension that we built primarily as an example, but it is useful and people are using it. Um, it's an archival extension, which modifies a resource to make all of the resources soft delete, as well as um, <clears throat> to make all the resources soft delete. And then it adds the archive dat attribute automatically to a resource. And so all that extensive extensibility comes from Spark. And it's also starting to be used in other domains. So Lucas, uh, you might know as Dorgan from Discord and Twitter, has written a really cool package called, I believe Channel Handler is the name of it. Um, yeah, Channel Handler. 
And <clears throat> it actually gives you a declarative way to sort of like a, a Phoenix router type thing to model your channels. And, and you can see there's like different event handlers. And, and you can see this actually really represents some of the really interesting and complicated things that you can do with Spark DSLs that are quite difficult to do otherwise. You can see there's uh, macros that take anonymous functions. That's actually not like if anybody's tried to do that, you'll see that that's a very non-trivial uh, problem if, they, if you have to store an anonymous function um, at compile time. But we actually automatically define a public function or we automatically define an actual function. It's just, there's a lot of magic in there that you don't have to worry about that actually just makes it all work. And it's, it's, it's very useful. Um, okay. What is a resource? This is probably the one that I'm going to spend not as much time as you would like if you've not, if you're not familiar with Ash. Um, but the sort of actually explaining all of the bits of a resource that you might you know want to use, it would take the entire sort of presentation. Um, so we're going to do some glossing over here, but we can, I will happy to answer qu any questions after, uh, this section. Um, so a resource can be a lot of things and on the surface of it, um, based on like the sort of examples and what other tools it looks like, people will often, you know, um, say that it, they'll think of a resource as like a data mapper, like a way to, uh, like an ecto schema that's designed to, um, sort of expose your data model directly over an API or something like that. And that's one of the things you want to get out in front of pretty early, which is it's, it's not what that's for, or at least it lets you do that if you want to, like that is the simplest use case, but resources have rich interfaces. Um, and for describing both how they map to data, if they map to data, but also separately what their external interfaces look like in such a way that they don't have to match one to one. Um, and that, and you, so you have sort of the, the, um, air gap, or air gap might not be the right word, but the sort of interface layer that allows you to have, uh, to not just be exposing a database table directly to an API. <clears throat> so anything that can be interacted with can be a resource. Like 90% of the time, people building things with Ash, a resource is going to be something backed by Postgres and it's going to be, you know, it's going to be some simple wrappers over, over creates and updates. But I mean, that's not, that's not Ash's fault. That's just how the world is, right? 90% of what we build is stuff that is wrapping some sort of state um, without that much, you know, maybe massaging some data and doing some validation, that kind of thing. Um, but you could, for instance, have a Ash resource that just exposes a create action that um, will create an Oban job in the background or send an email or anything like that. Um, and likewise, you could have an Ash resource that exposes a read action to run a report or give back some calculated data that doesn't, it's not backed by any individual data layer. Uh, it's you provide the implementation and you know, you're off to the races. So while the base case, the ob, you know, the, the most often case is mapping something to a database table, uh, it does quite a bit more than that. Um, yeah, so most of the time it'll have a data layer. This is an example configuring a resource to, you know, sit on top of Postgres, for example. You say, well, hey, this is sourced from the Postgres uh, table called Discord messages. Um, this example is from an Ash HQ. We have a Discord bot that watches our forum channels and synchronizes the forum content to the Ash HQ, uh, which is important for accessibility. Like some people, either in some countries or uh, working at certain companies or things like that, they can't access the Discord forum. Uh, the Discord server, and we want to make that content searchable and that sort of thing, and 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 somewhere else public that people can view it. Um, so this is this is an example from there. Um, one thing you'll see here is the uh, the interface is standardized. So we have you know action types where we know exactly how those work, and anything outside of your resource knows how to use those actions. That's the important thing. So there's a lot of details in here. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna go through all of them, but you can see we have some default actions, read and destroy, do the default thing. And then you have a create action that takes arguments and it, it, it manages some related data. And same with update, it takes some arguments and manages some related data. And you can actually do pretty much anything you want in there. You have rich lifecycle hooks to implement whatever, whatever thing you want. Um, and the important bit here is that if something knows how to work with a resource, it can use your code. So in this example, I've got the resource hard coded, right? At, you see ashhq.discord.message. But what you can do is if I have a resource and an action name, then I can look at the action. I can say, well, what inputs does this take? And I can figure that out. I can provide the inputs that I need to take or that I need it to take. So this is how all of our tooling works is they introspect uh, 
these individual actions and the resource and the types of the things and to figure out what they need to do. And so if you know how to use a resource, then you can it can use your code. Um, and that is a huge boon for building tooling around resources. Does anybody have any questions about Ash resources? So is this using Ecto in any way or no? Yes. Um, so it, depending on how you use Ash, it uses Ecto to varying degrees. Um, so for compatibility reasons, every Ash resource is also an Ecto schema, which means if you define, you, like you can just say like repo.all an Ash resource and use it as if it was a schema that was equivalent to that. And it will, it just, just works. Um, and if you're using one of our, like a different data layer, like we have an Ash ETS data layer, we don't use we don't use Ecto to do the querying, for example. We just wrote our own thing for that. And if you were writing your own data layer, you probably also wouldn't use Ecto or maybe you would. Um, but Ash Postgres, for example, I'm not going to reinvent all of the things that Ecto is. I mean, it would be a, a it would just be wild to sort of redo all that. And so what we do is we um, we build an Ecto query that we run. This, you know, so basically, we sort of do it on your behalf. We just build an Ecto query from Ash queries and the resources and all that um, and run the queries that way. And that prevents us from having to do all sorts of things like type casting and loading and dumping and, and all the, you know, query expression to SQL and caching and all the stuff that, that Ecto handles. The things that really make all of this work together um, and make it special is that we're not stopping at, it was where it didn't stop at this basic interaction layer. Um, instead, we are continuing to push the declarative model and what can be done declaratively into all these different pieces. And we're, we're still doing that. And you'll see some examples of things that are coming up even um, that do that. But um, what this means is it actually enables a certain kind, like it enables um, new kinds of tools that I don't really think exist in other places. Um, so let's talk about some of these. Um, one of the things that's really important is we have standardized building blocks that you can define and put and use reuse in various places in your application or that libraries can provide for you. Um, this is an example of a change. Um, this is what we call, it's like a plug, but for your create, update, and destroy actions. So you take a change set and some config, and then you do some stuff. And in this case, this is a encrypt plug and or an encrypt change. And so what it's gonna do is it's going to, uh, right before the action is submitted, it's going to, um, it's going to encrypt some attributes and then change them you know, to the new encrypted values uh, on the way in. Uh, this is a preparation. So preparations are for queries. And in this case, we have an attribute that uh, won't sort properly, uh, or at least it won't sort the way you think it will. So that's the version. It's a semver that we store, uh, a semantic version that we store like you know, 1.1.2 uh, on all of our library versions that we index in Ash HQ. But if you just try to sort that, in Postgres, for example, it'll sort it the string, you know, alphabetically, which it's not going to sort them by semantic version rules. Um, however, we added a calculation to the resource, which I'll talk about in a little bit, which is called sortable version, which is that string split up as an as a list. And if you sort the list, you know, things against each other using uh, items in the list, then it will sort properly according to semantic versioning. So this preparation allows us to sort of intercept a request to sort by version and say, actually, they mean they want to sort by uh, sortable version. Uh, we also, so th those are some examples. Honestly, they're all over the place. I couldn't show you all of them. There's there's a lot of these building blocks you can define. Um, we also have manual implementations of all sorts of things. So this is a good example here. This is a manual create action. So what that means is typically after we do all the action stuff and we validate the input and all that, we then ask your data layer, we say, hey, create this thing. And that generally is going to be a relatively simple operation of like, I'm just going to do the insert now. Um, but you can say, well, no, this one, I'm going to figure out how to do that. Like this is, and, and that lets you do all sorts of things. It lets you, you know, anything you can't figure out how to do with like a change or in your, in your action, for example, you can use a manual action to do whatever you need. Um, this case is actually from a chat bot, which hasn't been generally shared, but it's uh, uses chat GPT to answer questions about Ash. Um, and so we have an ask question on our questions resource and that ask action will reach out to, uh, multiple services. It'll tokenize your input and then it'll ask chat GPT for a response, all this sorts of stuff. Right. Um, and so we use a manual action for that. And so you, you can see already how like you can kind of do anything you want, right? We're not like, this is a, 
the questions resource sits on top of, of the Postgres database, for example. Um, however, this manual action is, you know, going to do a bunch of network work before it ever creates the thing in, in question. So uh, it's very flexible. We also have, and this is something that I think um, is is really useful. We have manual relationships. So unlike, you know, in Ecto, you have your sort of regular, you have your relationship options, right? And you have some options, some of which I even contributed, which is the ability to add where clauses on relationships and things like that. Um, but with Ash, you can actually have a manual relationship, which is fully implemented by yourself and could do things like a graph traversal or reach out to a network service to figure out what's linked. You could do whatever, you, whatever it is that you need it to do. Um, and there's even tools actually to make them uh, joinable. Like, or, so you can imp say, here's how I would do the Ecto query that will connect these two things, which now means your relationship can be used in filters and sorts and aggregates and calculations. We'll talk about those later. Um, uh, something you'll also see here is that all of these, um, most of the tools that you can implement by defining a module, you can actually also implement in line by defining an anonymous function. So if it's something simple, you could just put it right there in the resource. If you've used like absinthe, for example, where you define anonymous functions right in the DSL, um, you can do it that way too, if you want um, or not, or you can write a module. We always make sure that there's those two options available where you could also put it somewhere else because maybe you want to share it. Um, this is this one here is an interesting example because we have uh, our blog posts on Ash HQ are stored in a resource, but that resource reads markdown files that has mark that has metadata in the markdown file. Um, and then the tags are stored in a CSV file using the Ash CSV data layer. Um, and so when we want to figure out what the tags are for a given resource, what we actually do is we there's a tag names attribute that's stored in metadata on the file, and we find all tags that are in my tag names list. So you can do all sorts of stuff that doesn't have to be conventional relational database -y stuff. You could use this for graph databases, for example, if you wanted to have like an outgoing edges uh, relationship or you know, whatever you want. Um, so that's another example where Ash sometimes looks sort of like a relational data tool where you just sit it on top of Postgres and that's how it works. But it does not have to be that. Okay, let's talk about calculations a little bit here. Um, I recently did a Ash, uh, uh, I started a series called Ash Primers, um, which I'm, I'm hoping to do a video a week going over some simple, you know, different things in, in you know, uh, with simple summaries, that sort of thing. And I did one on calculations. So if you want more info, you can check out the YouTube channel. Um, but calculations are uh, pretty useful. They, uh, I mean, actually I would say calculations are probably one of the main differentiating factors um, in, in Ash that make it extremely useful, which is that you can add computed properties to your resources. Um, and so in this one, this example you're seeing here, this is computed at within like Elixir. So this is the decrypt calculation that allows you to say, uh, when the user asks for like, in this case, like decrypted email or something like that, um, this will, you know, decrypt that value on demand. Um, and you can see that it's kind of imp it's implemented using the data loader pattern essentially under the hood. So you always take a list of things you're going to calculate the value for and return a list of things that you're going to calculate the value for. Um, and you can express dependencies. You see this select and this load option here where I can say, I need some piece of loaded data, some like other thing, right? And so in this case, it's going to say, well, I need the field I'm going to decrypt to also be selected in order for me to decrypt the, the value, right? So. Uh, this is one way to do it. However, there are drawbacks to this kind of calculation, which is you can't use it in filters or calculations or, or uh, you know, in the data layer, obviously, because it happens in Elixir land. Um, so we have another kind of calculation. Um, they're really the same thing, but we won't dive into that, you know, but um, essentially we have Ash has a whole expression language built in. that's sort of similar to if you're familiar with using Ecto, it's similar to what you might write when you write like an Ecto query, for example. Um, but this expression syntax can be lifted up and run in Elixir, or it can be lowered into the data layer and it's designed to be portable. So we can use it for queries against, uh, Ash, uh, the ETS data layer or against Ash Postgres or whatever. And you actually, there's a tool you can say, uh, run this filter. You can have a list of things and run an Ash expression as a filter over it. So it's a very portable tool that can be used for all sorts of things. And in this case, uh, we have a, this is to limit the amount of questions you can ask our chatbot in any one conversation. Um, and so we actually say, um, this, uh, calculation will be run in the data layer. It, you'll see it appear like in your SQL statement that like, you know, the question count is greater than whatever that static number is like 10, for example. Um, and so you can actually define this expression language supports all sorts of interesting things, which you'll see some examples of later. Um, <clears throat> but I'll also show you aggregates. So I'm going to go back to this. You see question count there? 
that's just saying, you know, well, what's question count? Um, question count is an aggregate. So aggregates are similar to calculations, except what aggregates allow for is aggregating um, related data. So in this case, a conversation has many questions and I want to surface a uh, computed property on a uh, conversation called question count, which is the number of related questions where the bot gave them a successful answer, where there wasn't like an API error or something like that. And so that's what question count is. And you can see, if I go back to this example, I was able to use that in a calculation. So calculations are composable with other calculations and other aggregates in your resource. And so you can build, like you can build, you can break up the various things that you calculate for a given resource into separate calculations. And they, I mean, there's a lot that you can do there. They can even take arguments. Individual calculations can take arguments. So take a look at the video on YouTube um, and read the guide on Ash HQ for more there. But um, they're really powerful concepts. Uh, oh, yeah. Also, you can use it to lift up fields from related uh, records to be as if it was a field on this record. So this is on our guide resource. And one of the things that you would often want to know on a guide, this is actually used to, to when you do full text search, um, is you need to know what the, well, what's the name of the library that this guide uh, is inside of in the documentation. And you can see we have this first aggregate, which is essentially saying, take the first related value that you find. Um, and in this case, these are all two one relationships. So you know there's only one anyway. Um, but we say the library name is, if you go through library versions and then the library, and then you get the name, then that's the library name of a guide. And so you can use, and then now you can use related data in calculations. You can use aggregates over related data in calculations and filters and sorts, all that sort of stuff. Um, so like I could sort guides by their library name. Policies, this is a lot to dive into. So I'm just gonna point out that policies exist. Um, policies are probably a whole com conference talk on their own. Um, and, but, um, uh, Rebecca at, uh, Alembic, uh, just rewrote the policy guide and it's quite nice. So I would say, check it out if you have any questions there. But the point is that Ash is actually aware of sort of current user. We call it the actor and you can write in your policies about what users can and can't do and under what conditions they can and can't do those things directly into the resources. Um, and they will be. And you just set, you know, here's the person doing the thing. And that enables you to put in like model level audit logging. And uh, you, there's honestly so many features with policies. I'm just going to have to stop there because we'll be talking for hours on it. Um, okay. One last thing I'm going to talk about before I stop here and, and, and take some questions is synthesizing operations. So this is another one where I can't really describe all the little things that we do. Um, and there's more things on deck that we're going to do to make this even cooler. But um, one of the things that happens with Ash is you might use multiple data layers across your resources. For example, in Ash HQ, we have Ash, uh, the blog posts, which live in the blog data layer, which is a markdown file data layer. And then we have the tags, which live in a CSV file. <clears throat> and I can actually uh, filter the blog posts where they have a given tag. And, it, and Ash will see that you've crossed a data layer boundary in your filter. So it will replace that tags.name equals elixir It'll go find all of the tags with that name, get their IDs, and then replace that section of the expression with like, well, where the tag ID is, whatever. Um, I'm actually thinking about this kind of not the best example, but the point is I can actually use things that are classically reserved to only things that are in a single data layer in uh, a filter like this and, and Ash will figure it out. A good example here is let's say, I mean, you, you still have to pay performance penalties if you try to do these sorts of things. So I'm not suggesting Ash like magically salt makes joining across disparate data sources fast. But if you have to do that, then you have to do that. That's like, you know, it's obviously the ideal is just right with Postgres, but if you can't, you can't. Um, a good example is if you had a user's resource and you had a GitHub issues resource that wraps the GitHub API and re could return the, the issues for a given user, you could say, uh, you could ask Ash to filter out the users that have an issue that contain the text, whatever. And if the if your data layer that if your resource that reaches out to GitHub can support that filter, then it will get all the issues that contain that text that are related to that user and re replace their IDs with the uh, relevant thing. And so you can actually just pretend like your GitHub issues are part of the same data layer that your user is, and that gives you like a lot of options. Um, okay, let's stop here. Are there any questions about the advanced features? I wonder if I could see uh, manual implementations again. <clears throat> Curious about that. Um, yes. 
had many relationships, for example. If I can go back here. Yep, so this is a manual relationship. Uh, not too familiar with Ash, to bear with me, but um, I was wondering like, how artificial can this be? Like, does this have to be based off of um, an actual tags table in a <clears throat> database? And could you have, um, I guess, multiple relationships that are, I guess, based off of tags? You want to have tags and then maybe a subset of tasks or, or tags. Uh, could that be, uh, could you have multiple, as many relationships on? uh the same data yep yep so um yes 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 and yes um you, it can be as arbitrary as you want it does need to return an instance of a resource but that resource itself doesn't have to be independently readable so you could just write a resource that you know it, like tags could just be a resource with no data layer and then you just return a list of tags from here so it could be ephemeral it could be computed even right not related to any state at all but just you know maybe like you have an alert levels relationship where the alerts that are on this are computed from other properties of the resource and then you could uh return a list of like alerts or something like that um and you can have as many relationships as you want and in fact unlike what your typical ecto setup is in ash you're generally encouraged to model things as relationships when possible so um, even when it's sort of synthetic, right? So a good example here is, um, this is something somebody was just doing the other day. Um, you have a log entries uh, relationship where this thing has many log entries, and then they want to display uh, the most recent, recent log entry. And so what you would do with that is you would define a has one log entry relationship. And then you can, in relationships, you can say filter, uh, or you can say sort and sort them by their inserted at descending. And so the, it, that implicitly adds like a limit one and will get you the most recent log entry. So you can use relationships um, as sort of, you know, ways to compute, you know, related things. The only thing that you can't really use a relationship for is polymorphism right now. So we still have that same sort of restriction that Ash has or that Ecto has where a given relationship returns a, a one list of things. Um, if you want to do polymorphism, you actually can. You have to write what's called a calculation. Well, we just talked about calculations that returns a union type. I won't break into that too much, but Ash has union types. And so you can have a calculation that is a list of unions of, you know, X, Y, or Z, and you can then uh, have your sort of polymorphism like that. Okay, extending Ash. So I'm not going to talk about this one as much as some of the other ones, but I want to point out that something we actually encourage people to sort of get into early is actually learning how to write extensions. Extensions allow you to do effectively arbitrary things to your resources and actually not just your resources, but anything that is modeled as a DSL can be extended. So your APIs, your registries, we have a thing called ash.flow, which I haven't even touched on just for interest of time, but ash.flow is a whole, the whole thing for modeling workflows in ash. Um, but, uh, yeah. So here is an example of some code from our search extension that add some attributes and some calculations and some actions and uh, query preparation. It does all this sort of stuff to set up what full text search looks like for a given resource. It even adds custom statements that uh, will add indexes in the migration generator, which I haven't even talked about yet. I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but so you can do really, really useful things uh, with extensions. Um, <clears throat> so they often will typically come along with configuration driven tools that leverage those extensions. So the Ash JSON API, for example, it provides a resource extension to describe how this thing looks in, in an API. Um, but then there's also like, there's the implementation part of that, that is its own other thing. And so this is the index controller from Ash JSON API. And you can see, we figure out, okay, well, what resource are we getting? What's the action we're calling? What API are we calling? Like what's the route that is, you know, that is being used right now. And then it calls, it goes into its sort of generic, uh, you know, route to sort of figure out, um, what to do. And so that's what most extensions will look like. They'll look like a configuration layer that you can you know, use somewhere and then the actual implementation elsewhere. And yeah, the built-in extensions are just the beginning. Um, they're all built with tools that you have access to. So there's like the, all the extensions that we have, there's, there, there's no like private boundaries that let us write Ash authentication, for example, that would prevent you from writing something just like Ash authentication. Those are all public to public interfaces that allow you to write whatever extensions that you want. And in fact, we encourage it. I would say like Ash GraphQL and Ash JSON API, um, 
you know, while small teams may not find it useful to, you know, re reinvent those wheels, um, it is more of a build your own framework than it seems like it is. So if, if you were to say vet Ash GraphQL and say, you know what, this doesn't really work the way that I want it to, or vet, vet Ash JSON API and say, you know, I think we need some different thing. Um, the principles of how those were built can still be used to build new extensions. And it's actually not as hard as it seems like it would be. Um, so it, it can be a very much sort of build your own framework uh, that you can, you know, write your own extensions with. Deriving the rest. Um, so I'm just gonna show some of the sorts of things that we derive and what we can derive um, and what the sort of point is. And we're also gonna talk about some cons of this pattern. There, Cause there are drop, like anybody who tells you that, that whatever technical choice they're trying to convince you to make has no drawbacks, right? Like you should avoid them at all costs, right? Um, so uh, there are new problems that arise from this, new things you have to be aware of and like new ways of thinking that you have to, new, new ways of solving these problems. Um, now my pitch is just that those, I would rather solve those problems than problems that doing this a different way might arise. So, um, but one of the things we can do is we have a migration generator. So what you would do, let's say you started a new project, you define some resources, you would say to uh, generate the migrations and it would generate an ecto migration that will create all the tables and add all the attributes and that sort of thing. And it will also save some snapshots in your resource or in your uh, repo. And then when you uh, make a change, so you add an attribute, you say it will generate migrations and it will look at the what your stuff looks like now, compare it to the snapshots and it will generate a migration to add um, to add a that attribute to or to add that field to the table. I'm actually gonna. I think the next video that I do for Ash Primers, which I plan to do tomorrow, is gonna be about the migration generator, and it's gonna show that it actually supports a lot more than just um, a lot more than just like fields and tables. You can actually use it to add custom indexes. You can use it to add fully custom statements, and those actually, while it might be a little bit counterintuitive, those actually live in your resource. But I think. One of the things, if you've ever been in one of those situations where you've had an app that you've been working on for a long time and you have like 150 migrations and you want to you wanna find a way without having to like open up a database and figure out what the, well, the way the database is configured, there is no one place that tells you what the database actually looks like for a given resource except for running the migrations against your local database and that's how you can figure it out. Um, and even then that's a little bit inconvenient. Um, but with Ash, you've actually put that stuff in the resource and the migration generator will add those things to the migrations and manage the like sort of up and down of those statements. And so what that means is I can go in, if there's like a check constraint that's been added, I can see that there's a check constraint on the underlying table in the uh, Ash resource. Or if there's a custom statement that does something like add a weird index, that'll actually be in the resource. And you know, while counterintuitive, normally you're used to seeing that stuff in, in migrations, uh, I would much rather uh, not have to crawl through a bunch of files or you know poke around in my database to figure out what the database structure uh, would look like. <clears throat> admin UI. So we call this an admin UI, and I will say over time we have realized this may have been a bit of a misnomer. We're still kind of like fleshing this out, but it's really more like a uh, Ash dashboard. So think of it more like Phoenix Live dashboard. It's not something that you would put necessarily in front of your customers. Um, maybe you would use it for early prototyping phases, or you would put it in front of your customers, like sort of before you had some UI, but it's not the sort of thing that people would log into and get a sort of custom experience, but it is a way where you can set up so that like all of your resources have a, uh, a UI that you can go interact with. So if you write some actions and you want to see like, well, what happens when I do this, you could go into IEX or you could go into the admin UI. And that actually allows you in like those, those early prototypical days to test with stakeholders and say, well, hey, you want to see what happens when you create a thing, like go to the admin UI and go to the resource and you know hit the create button. And, and it'll provide a form for every action that can be taken in your resource. And so it can be a really valuable tool for testing. Um, and you can use it for more than that. In fact, I in uh, a video with uh, Josh, uh, I showed how I use that actually to edit my blog. So I open up the admin UI and I, there's a markdown editor built into the admin UI that you can specify for certain fields. And then I edit my blog files and save it and it writes them to disk. So it has a lot of uses, but I would say we're still, it's, it's still a little rough, like it's still rough around the edges, but we are, uh, we're going to keep iterating on it. And I think we may even rewrite it in a good way with somebody who look i'm not the ui guy ask anybody right like i can make it work but i will not make it beautiful that's not my that's not my shtick um unlike theo <laughs> um no but uh uh 
I think we're probably going to have have it sort of redesigned with somebody with an eye for you know, things like accessibility and and making it actually um, you know, fun to use that kind of thing. Um, the sort of obvious one here is APIs, right? Like that's the, one of the main things that people are looking for deriving is is to derive an API. So here's an example of a GraphQL configuration for our guides resource, where we say this is all we say that GraphQL block. That's the that's the entirety of the GraphQL configuration for uh, guides in Ash HQ. Um, and we also, I show also supplementally here that there's the action read for version. So you can see there's a list, uh, query in GraphQL called list guides, and then it calls an action called read for version. And, uh, I show that action here that it's non-trivial, right? It has some arguments that have constraints. It has pagination configuration, it does filtering based on those arguments, all that sort of stuff. And then what we get from that is this is a snippet from the Explorer. And you can see we get, uh, a list guides query that is paginated automatically right out of the gate um, that has that is filterable so you can provide a you know a, a filter for it it has the limit offset that sort of thing um, it has you can sort it and you even see like the default value for limit for example like we we build a really high quality api just automatically for you that's all typed out um, right out of the gate okay now let's talk about cons because this is where they come into play. I would say this is this is where people who will often they'll say, well, I I prefer to separate my API layer in somewhere else and maintain that separately. And there are there are good reasons to do that. I would I would argue that they aren't good enough to not do it. And so I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. But um, so your first question is like, well, what gets derived, right? Like you have to kind of know. Well, okay, well if I have this action that looks like this, or if I have this resource that looks like this, well, what is it going to look like in GraphQL? You can't just like, you're not just going to publish a GraphQL having no idea how it behaves. Um, and so you don't, you don't get sort of released from having to understand your tools. Like you, you still have to know how Ash GraphQL works. However, I will say most people discover how it works over time. Like, especially if you're doing greenfield development, you'll just add the GraphQL stuff your resource and you'll say, oh, okay, so that's the API that I got from that. And you'll say, I, I like that, right? And it's a predictable transformation. It's not like we just make random choices. So like once you learn what it creates for you, then you are, you know, you know it and that you can carry that knowledge forward. Um, but it can be a sort of discoverable, iterable process. Um, but still, like this is a, an example, right? If you want to get a, a, an enum, this is one way to do it. There's other ways, but this is one way. And you might have to know that. It's, there's nothing that stops you from, so we're not trying to abstract fully the knowledge of how GraphQL works or how you could write an API. That's not the point. Um, but also, uh, what about API stability? So I, I mentioned that earlier, but API stability is huge, especially if you're doing things like mobile apps where somebody could be on your mobile app from like six months ago, right? And, and different people have different rules about it, different requirements for API stability. Sometimes if you're just building like your own app, you don't even care. You're just gonna like make sure that all clients are on the latest version. Otherwise they get like their session reset or whatever. And at that point, like you're like, whatever, you know what I mean? I, I, I don't need to worry about these problems. Um, however, not everybody has that luxury and API stability is extremely important. Um, <clears throat> and I would say that I agree with the problem statement, but not the solution of maintaining what is effectively a copy of your entire app, you know, sort of over in another place that maps all of the fields from one, you know, A to B and has to do all the, it has to do type convert, all this sort of stuff, right? It, I just don't think it's worth that to have a, to get the API stability. I think there are other ways to achieve API stability. Um, for example, you can actually, with GraphQL, for example, you can generate your schema file and you can make it part of your CI to check the old schema file and the new schema file and raise and fail CI if you have introduced a breaking change into your GraphQL schema. And then you can go figure out, well, using Ash GraphQL, how do I not break my API? Um, so that, there's all sorts of options like that. Let me show one using resources themselves. Um, here's an example of if we had that type field that I mentioned earlier, that has, uh, you know, can be foo or bar. Um, adding an option to an enum is a breaking change, especially if people are doing things like writing, um, you know, type gen. If they're doing like type generation through TypeScript or whatever, right? Like it's a breaking change and they'll know about it. The front end won't build that sort of thing. Um, 
And so what we can actually do is we can use in GraphQL, we can, well, let's say in the resource, we can create a, a calculation that will only be those two original types. So you can see this is an example of a sort of richer expression you can do. I can use if else, and it will be translated in Postgres, for example, to case when then, right? So it'll do the right thing in the right data layer. Um, and so this says, well, okay, well, you know, we're going to have the front end treat these new types as this original type. Um, and then we're going to remap the field names just for GraphQL. And so we're going to say now type is going to be called new type for the GraphQL and GraphQL type is going to be called type. And so now like Ash GraphQL will take care of ferrying the values in and out and making sure that they, you know, get mapped to the right place on updates and all that sort of stuff. Um, but now you've retained uh, API compatibility and you've done it all using the declarative tools you have there. And now I know, like, I don't have to be, a, I don't have to like, Okay, I'm hunting down. Like, what? Where does new type come from? I'm like, oh, I gotta go find in the GraphQL resolver that there's a place that like renames type to new type. And it just, to me, I think that that is not worth it. Um, okay, that is it for deriving the rest. What's coming up? So, uh, we still have a really long way to go, and I want to make this sort of clear that I, I mean, maybe it sounds maybe dramatic. I don't know, but I imagine that I'm gonna be working on Ash for at least like five to 10 years, if not like for the rest of my life, like, because I think that this project has effectively unlimited potential in the long run. And I'm finding re repeated value add in extending this um, because of the core patterns that we've set down. So uh, we have a roadmap. That roadmap is visible uh, on the Ash project um, uh, organization in GitHub. It's a cross project roadmap. So sort of all the things that we plan on doing are coming up. Um, before I get into specific things that are sort of the big cool changes, I'm going to talk about uh, what I think anybody who is currently using Ash is aware of, which is constant quality of life and ergonomics improvements. So we take the, you know, even though there are a lot of developer experience improvements to be made, we still take developer experience very seriously and we work uh, very diligently on that front. And it's even actually part of our philosophy. If, if you look at the Ash HQ philosophy guide, um, we talk about that we'll always prioritize current users over like a sort of thing where like, oh, we want Ash to work this way someday. And so we're going to screw up all the people that are like, have embedded, have invested their time or are staking the success of their business or their venture or whatever it is on the way on Ash. Those people to me are always the number one priority and, he, and, and will remain such. And so oftentimes we have a much bigger focus on fixing current bugs than we do necessarily on like adding the next big feature. Um, although we still, you know, continually add features. Uh, the point is that we we feel like a, a high level of responsibility for our users and those people that have opted to use Ash. Um, so if you look at this, this is like 2000 lines average a week of code going into Ash that, and a lot of those are solving the bugs that people come up with or making quality of life improvements so that they can build the things that they're building uh, better. Okay, let's talk about actual things though. The things that the actual cool things that are up coming up that I think people should be excited about. So bulk actions are coming. I'm working on them. I have a, a lot of work done towards it. And bulk actions um, are essentially these, the create, update, and destroy uh, patterns, but essentially supported um, kind of like how you have repo.insert all to bulk in, insert things, but supported across data layers. And I would say, generally speaking, um, a lot, it's a thicker layer over that underlying tooling. Um, so, you know, repo.insert all, for example, does like relatively little, it just sort of maps to an insert all statement, but our bulk actions will be their, you know, how do I describe it? They're streaming processes. So you could provide a stream, for example, bulk insert, and it will like batch it appropriately. And it will handle all of your before and after action hooks that are configured on your resource. It'll do all the right things. And it'll even optimize. Like if you don't have any after action hooks, then it won't do the work of like returning the, the record unless you've asked it to, all that sort of stuff. So there's, it's going to be a really sort of smart system for streaming uh, actions. And as, as well as another part of bulk actions will be for updates and destroys, you'll be able to provide a single change set and a query so that we'll be able to say, you know, for every thing that comes up in this query, I want to update them this way. Um, and those will map to bulk operations at the data layer as well. Um, <clears throat> this goes, this next part goes a little hand in hand with all of this. Um, and is actually, I think, pretty sort of necessary for uh, bulk updates, uh, which is atomics. So atomics are a way to model things like uh, if you have like, you know, 
a classic example of an atomic operation is like adding one. If you want to have an incrementing counter. In Ash right now, there is no way in the built-in DSL to do that. What you do is you write a manual action that will run an ecto query or something like that to, to increment your value. Um, which it works, you know, but obviously I think we can do better. And I think atomics need to be part of the core model that Ash provides. And so in here, you can see we have an atomic called increment score that takes an argument called points. And it's like, how many points should I add to the score? And then you can see we have this win game action that uh, uses that atomic to set the score to the result of that atomic. So it's very similar to a calculation, but it can be used. Uh, for these. And that means that would, you know, that's very important for things like uh, bulk updates, because you don't necessarily want to like fetch every record and then add one to it. So I mean, there's like, not only is that slow, there's like actual problems with it, unless you like are going to lock the rows and that sort of thing, like you, you will get inconsistent results. Um, so atomics are important. And that's going to be done as part of bulk actions, or, or part of bulk updates. Um, generators. Uh, Generators are coming as well. Um, oh, I, I, I lost it. Where is it? Okay, generators. Um, people have been asking for this. And as we have more and more extensions and more and more things that you can do, like the base configuration of Ash is growing. Even though I'd say compared to pretty much anything else I've seen, it has a very low boilerplate um, sort of count. Like it, you, there's not a bunch of crap you have to set up uh, relative to other things. There is still some, and it gets tedious if people are starting new projects to do it all again. So we're going to have a mix at a minimum, a mix ash dot new command that will sort of pull in Phoenix. If you want to use Phoenix and all that sort of work. So that's on the roadmap. Um, Oh, I didn't have it up while I was talking. Uh, and then, yeah, more extensions. We want SQLite, light, my and SQL server. Uh, those are important. Um, we also want a CQRS extension and actually a user in our discord has created an ash commanded extension. Um, which re essentially rewrites the underlying resource where the create action will be uh, like an event. And then the result of that is handled in an aggregate. I forget, actually, I forget the commanded terminology, but essentially it, you can now hook into and treat your resource that looks like this thing you can create, update and destroy, for example. Um, but in fact, those are things going over an event bus that follow the commanded conventional patterns. Um, and I think that's still experimental, but it's an example of how like the point is not this simple data mapper. Like you can do a lot more with Ash. And so we would like to have a CQRS extension, maybe even just make that Ash commanded extension um, production ready because commanded provides a bunch of, of great uh, tools around that. Um, gRPC uh, and other API extensions. Um, and then multi-data layer is going to be a big one. So we have these data layers defined with their, cap it's, we can talk about that a lot, but there's capabilities that come with it. Like what can your data layer do, all this sort of stuff. Um, and we'd like to create a data layer that will synthesize the behavior of multiple data layers for a single resource. Um, so what you might do is you might have one data layer, you'd configure like Postgres and ETS for your resource. And then you'd say ETS is a write through cache, or uh, you might say configure Postgres and like, um, like an AWS cold storage service with Glacier. There's some ice related name for AWS's cold storage uh, tool, whatever that's called. Um, you know, you might say, well, cold storage in this resource, in this data layer over here, things like that. Um, and so we would like to have, I think that's going to be a little bit further off in the future, but we'd like to have a multi data layer to uh, compose different data behaviors. Um, okay, that's the end of the show. Um, thanks for coming to my TED talk. Um, okay. So are there any questions about all this stuff? Anything that, uh, I can clarify, uh, yeah, just go ahead shoot. Do you have any, um, resources you can point to me on, on the, uh, I guess doing APIs, um, I guess particularly like GraphQL or JSON APIs where I could find that documentation. Um, yeah, so all of the documentation is on Ash HQ. We are still working a bit on the sort of ergonomics of searching it, but it is all up there. Um, and you can also go look at the hex package for Ash GraphQL, for example, to see those guides. Um, there are a few example apps out there. Ash HQ does do a little bit with GraphQL. Um, my plan eventually is to make Ash HQ have like a full fledged JSON API and um, a JSON API and a uh, uh, GraphQL so that you can have like a really good example of like what a whole application implemented that way might look like. Um, but I haven't done that yet. Um, and then we also have a discord server, by the way, with like 600 people in there or something. So like, I mean, not 600 people, active users all the time, probably like 50 or 60 active users, but, um, you know, feel free to jump into that discord, uh, uh where somebody's always around to answer questions. 
Um, there's a question on in the chat, which is where do raw actions fit into the roadmap? Those are implemented currently, so they're those you can use them right now. Um, like the oh oh, you mean we talked about raw actions with somebody in the Discord, and I think this might be that person. Um, which is yeah yeah yeah. I didn't talk about this on the. I need to put this on the roadmap somewhere. But basically, the idea of you'd have like an action that it just exists on a resource and returns some arbitrary type of things. Um, yeah, exactly. Uh, so uh, what we would do is uh, essentially have an action which says I return some type of data, and then you could do like anything that doesn't follow like an action template. Um, that just is on the roadmap. I don't I don't know when. Probably in the soon category or the. Uh, the, maybe the someday category. So uh, I'll make a GitHub issue for it and put it on the roadmap. You were talking about the generators. Is it is it my understanding that the generators will will take like existing like say an Ecto schema and turn that into a, a, an Ash resource? Is that what the generators are doing? Or uh, that would be super cool, but no. <laughs> um, the uh, the generator is really just for starting a new Ash application. Um, okay. Like kind of makes Phoenix new, but for Ash. Um, there are there has been some work on like a sort of a thing where you can just like add a use ash dot resource on into your ecto schema and have it like reverse engineer the resource attributes from the field. But uh, the truth is like it's not really that hard to just write the ash resource that looks like your ecto schema and like it it it's one of those things where like how when is the juice worth the squeeze? Um, and it's you know. Is there a plan to add generators for things like making a new resource or API? Um, this is not a thing. There is a plan. Um, it just, one of the things that's kind of interesting about Ash resources is they generally do a good job of encapsulating like the minimum amount of stuff you would have to write in the first place to make the resource. Um, and so because of that, if you wanted to like write a script to generate one, you would have to do about as much typing to in your CLI as you would in the file. Now that doesn't mean it's not valuable. It's just that, you know, we follow, it's the way that these development of these things go is like, we follow the pain points primarily, right? Pain driven development effectively. Um, and it's like pretty easy to just open a new file and make a resource and you have to do about the same amount of typing. So, uh, it is a, there, we would like to do that. And we would like to even have generatable examples and things like that, where you can say, give me an example, like generate me a resource that's using GraphQL. And we want to use that as a learning tool. Um, so that people who aren't familiar with the framework can figure out how they might do X, Y, and Z. Um, but it's one of those things where like people are only learning for so long and then they know how to do it. And then the, you know, the generators aren't as useful. So, uh, we will do it at some point. It just kind of needs its champion, I guess. Has anyone built an application that uses live view and provides a GraphQL for say a mobile app? Seems like a way to have your cake and eat it too. Yes. Um, so Ash. HQ, for example, has that. Um, actually, I don't know. Does the um, does the uh, real world demo app? Somebody built a real world demo application which uses Live View. Somebody at Alembic, I mean, um, and, they, and it's a really great application. I don't think it has a GraphQL layer in addition to the Live View layer. Um, but Ash HQ does in fact have that, and I would actually say Live View plus an a the need for an API is one of the most compelling reasons to use Ash in the first place because. Uh, what happens is you build your whole app is like, you know, maybe context functions and like if you're doing this sort of normal Phoenix way, context functions and uh, live views. And then you're like, I need an API. And you discover that you've split your app up again uh, along something stuff is done in live view, some is in context. And then it's like, okay, I could add controllers or apps, or whatever. You know what I mean? Like you have to do all this sort of work now to figure out how to reshape your application to be ready for an API. Um, but in Ash, you, it's honestly, as long as you're designing reasonably resource oriented code and properly putting things behind actions and things like that, you really don't have that problem. Uh, you just add the GraphQL extension and you're off to the races. So uh, Ash HQ is kind of that. We have one GraphQL example query, but it is a live view app. So I think eventually it will be a great example of that. Oh, and there are plenty of people in the Discord if you want to ask. There's plenty of people who have done it. I just can't point you towards like an open source example of it. Uh, yeah. Um, thanks, right. everyone, uh, for listening to me talk for what was that like? An, oh, my gosh, that was a long time. It's an hour and 10 minutes. Um, so, yeah, I appreciate everybody uh, taking their time to come come see my talk. And if you have any questions in the Discord or, or I'm everywhere that Elixir people are, so uh, just reach out.